We're live, pal. What's going on? Look, hey everyone, thank you for joining us for a Q&A episode of Cinemax. Uh, sorry, it's been a couple of weeks, we've just been, well, Paul's been really busy and I've just been really, really ill. <laughs> Which is a form of being busy, busy with an illness, that sucks. Yeah, yeah and I'm still I'm trying to like, w- w- I'm still trying to go to work at the same time, but we've got like a heat wave at the minute, so I'm just like drained at work and I'm like, I should be at home in bed. So when y'all have a heat wave, um, for those of you who are listening and aware, uh, James is in England, um, and so there's a quite a time difference. Uh, so when there's a heat wave over there, do you still get tons of rain as well? Like that's the the English oh, thing, right? That's actually a great point you just brought up. So I think this Sunday, uh, it's been predicted that we're going to get some uh, thunderstorms. Lovely. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not too upset about that. Uh, in fact, it's a bit cooler because uh, I've said to you this Sunday, me boys are doing a tournament in uh, Hereford. So, yeah. I don't like driving when it's like super hot. I've got air conditioning and stuff, but I don't know. I've always said like you should never drive your vehicles when it's like too hot. So, if it's a little bit cooler, like I don't mind it. That's the um. That's the uh, 10 and under Kumite, right? Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, the elder seeks could be up against. Well, the elder seeks up against some kids who could be like a couple years older than him. What is happening there? Come on, are they checking these kids' uh, testosterone levels? What's going on? Performance enhancement? It's all about weight categories. Okay. But it's so, under a certain age, right? I mean, it's so not like they're just... Believe or not, so he's in, like, from 7-year-old to 14-year-olds. Okay. Uh, I was talking to another parent about it the other night, but what it is, it's all about weight categories. So, my eldest, he's 31.2 kilo, and his division is between 30 and 35 kilo. And I'm like, 5 kilo, that's a lot of weight. <laughs> difference what is that um, in stones because i always like to think of it as in stones when i'm talking about people's weight classes uh in the uk um, is that not just common if, just, it's kilograms everyone says kilograms right but like stones is that as common as people think yeah to be honest with you i go by pounds if anything but Martial arts. I don't know if it's Taekwondo or martial arts in general. They go by kilo. Okay. So, yeah, so five kilos is just over half a stone. Wow. So that's that's a bit, that's a decent amount of weight, for especially for kids. Yeah. You said it's like the 7 to 14. At least there's somewhat of an age range, right? They're not going to compete with like some kind of skinny 18-year-old. 19 year old who's like, I dropped weight to get into the tournament. Well, well, I was talking to one of the parents, if now I was like, you know, how many kids of that age is going to be, you know, 30 odd kilo? They must have like some growth problems if they are, or like very, very yeah. low testosterone. Need some more fish and chips. Come on. Some more yeah. kebabs. Uh, but no, looking <laughs> forward to it. Me, um, so he, he's got the, from what I heard, over 300 people signed up for it. So there's a fair few people. Uh, my middle boy, Sammy, he's got a really good chance. He didn't want to do it, but his instructor said to him, Sam, go for it. You've got a real good shot. And if you win it, you're literally like number one in the country for like his age. That's insane. Yeah, I know. So and wouldn't you... I, if... Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, if you... I'm proud of whatever they do. If they win a point, if they win a round, if they win a fight, even better if they get a medal over the moon, but man, if one of them ends up getting gold, you know, what can I say? I'd be like, wow, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Going to Nando's how, on the way <laughs> How much, let's be, let's, let's just get down to brass tacks here. How much of their early um, success and uh, ability and skill and talent, how much would you and it's okay, but how much would you take credit for for having shown them such martial arts classics 
uh, as recently, you just you would you you said you showed him the quest, right? Yeah, it's. I tell you what it is. I, I you know, we 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 talk, you know, lyrical about martial art movies. I feel like, and you can agree with this. Same as watching a wrestling match, it gives you a passion for it. So if yeah. I'm putting on these awesome like fan damn movies, let's be honest, fan damn movies. And if they can get into it, and it gives them like a passion, like wow, I want to be as good as that guy. Right. Um, you know what I believe? That's like the reason Van, the Van Damme movies. Oh, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. Keep jumping on. No, I'm so excited to start talking about martial arts movies. No, carry on. I was just thinking, like you know, say what you will about them. I think one of the reasons, um, and there are a lot of people who aren't Van Damme fans. I don't. I don't know these people. I don't associate with these people. No, Can't relate no. with these people. <laughs> However, for those of us uh, who get it and understand the value and the brilliance of Jean Claude Van Damme movies, wouldn't you say that part of his appeal um, is that he he takes a beating through like at least half if not three, three quarters of his films, you yeah. know, and then he starts to, like train differently or reach deep down into some sort of psychological memory bank um, to really fuel the fire. Like he, but we see him get his ass whipped for a good portion of his films. And to me, that's what makes him so relatable. I mean, none of us are going to be able to relate with his physical so. skill <laughs> or his wits. Or his chiseled ass that he shows off uh, in a good portion hey, of his man, movie. You never know. Give me, give me a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like, but how many Seagal movies do you see? And, I mean, Seagal's kind of low hanging fruit, um, but you know, he's never really in peril. Um, I mean, even Schwarzenegger gets gets put in situations like compromising situations. Yeah. I mean, I'll be. He's facing predators from another planet uh, and <laughs> mutilating his entire squad um, with no problem. And so he's really in death defying situations. Uh, but one film that comes to mind and <clears throat> I'm a big fan. I mean, you and I both are big fans of best of the best, <clears throat> but um, I don't know if you saw best of the best four. I've I've actually only just watched number two last couple of nights. It's so different oh, to the dude, first yeah. one. Like, oh yeah, maybe I'm thinking I mean, uh, three. I'm I so, might be thinking part three actually. Part two is Las Vegas, right? That's that's right. Yeah, it's I'm good. thinking. I think I'm thinking part three. Um, and Philip Ree. Brothers with Simon Ree, the famous Ree brothers, they're amazing martial artists and um, instructors and fight choreographers in Hollywood. Um, but I believe, I want to say Philip Ree directed, he might have written and directed part three. And I'm pretty sure it's part three. It might be four, but I'm pretty sure it's part three. But he's like, he goes to like this right, kind of racist town in the South. And kind of helps this town fight back against like white supremacists and stuff. But, and I haven't seen it in a long time, but something that I was just kind of like, nah, it was, I guess it was okay. It was like, he, I swear, he doesn't get hit once in the oh. entire movie. Like he just steamrolls through everybody. Yeah. And to me, that just doesn't, that's not appealing to me. I want to see our leads, like our heroes, you know, in peril. I want to see them, you know, facing a situation that they may not be able to overcome. And to me, I always just revert back to Van Damme. Like he really, he really identified that formula. Um, I mean, even Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, you know, was always in a situation where he was um, getting roughed up pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. like whether against Han and his many uh, hand contraptions of claws and things of that nature, or even like Chuck Norris in the Roman Coliseum, you know, oh, like to, every, to, to, yeah, to they, stop you there for two seconds. Uh, so, Mike, my, my son, so he's got an Instagram now. 
So if everyone wants to follow oh. him, James James Dean TKD, he posts like a lot of these pictures of him training, and he uh, posted a Bruce Lee meme, and it's the pitch. There's a shot of him, you know, with the claw marks from Han. Yeah. And underneath it, it says, "I've told you to cut your toenails before training." <laughs> oh, I think I've seen that. That's like a meme or something, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty That's funny. Pretty funny. Jesus. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, we'll get to everyone's questions in a minute. But um, I think someone actually interviewed uh, Seagull and they actually asked them asked them that. They said, "How come you're never in peril?" He's like, "Because my fans don't think it would be realistic." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we gotta interview these fans. We gotta find these fans, and both of us. I mean. <laughs> 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 to be I fair, mean, to be big... fair, I was I was a Seagull fan growing up. Me mother loved Seagull. Yeah, I was too. I mean, I think we all liked at least a Seagull film, albeit very early in What's his introduction. What's my favorite? Yeah. Um maybe Marked for Death. Yes. Yeah. Great. I think Marked for Death is pretty awesome. Faced. Yeah, yeah. I just, I loved it. I mean, I liked Above the Law as well. Um, but Marked for Death, I thought, had um, more more of a range of, of characters and villains and stuff. Um, but, I, you know, I enjoyed Under Siege. Under Siege 2 is pretty ridiculous, especially if you find out about some of the, like, some of his behind-the-scenes behavior. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, there's like a, I want to say it's like a 16 year old Catherine Heigl plays his yeah, yeah. daughter, right? Um, Things like his niece. Something like that, right? But yeah, like, yeah, 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 she yeah. did not have, she's a, she's a kid, yeah. She did not have glowing memories of working with him on that movie. So, um, I can't say I remember on Deadly Ground. I think that was like one of his first, like, environmentalist kind of, Movies, right? Where he's got someone like, like a pig. pig. Yeah, yeah. He's got the Native American green jacket. Um, yeah, just you know. And then you go on and you 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 see how I think he's still considered the worst guest in Saturday Night Live history because he was turning down pretty much every skit that was presented to him. And they were trying to get through to him, like, you know, and I think his his pushback was, you know, not wanting to look foolish and not wanting to be put in, like, these compromising situations, which are a lot of what comedy is about, you know, is making yourself vulnerable. And they were trying to explain to him, like, look, like, we know you're a badass. Like, we're trying to, like, this is, this is, this is actually going to make you more popular Cause it's going to make you endearing to people. He's like, Oh, I just, you know, I don't, I don't approve of that. I'm not doing that. And then like, he, he like, uh, cuddled together some skit, I think towards the end where he ended up bringing in like his own, like stunt guys or something. Like he did a skit towards the yeah. end or something, which didn't even have, I think like any Saturday night live cast members in it, maybe one or so, but he's just like beating up all these stunt guys. And then he's like, and that's what happens when you mess with the environment or something like he there's this message out there. <laughs> I don't know. It's these words. Yeah. Um, oh, well. but own, you know, always gets put in, in, a, in a, in a situation where he's getting his ass handed to him and he, he digs down deep. I mean, um, not even talking about the Rocky films. I mean, those are, yeah, I was thinking of them. Oh, and, in terms of underdog, you know, fighting up. So, um, yeah, but I think, I think the Van Damme stuff that, that always stands out to me is the best. Um, and, uh, but did they like, did they like the quest overall? Yeah. Um, um me, me, the boy, Sammy, he went to sleep cause it was on, we did put on quite late, but, uh, no, JD, well, I call him JD for short. Sure. Um, he stayed up and, um, watched a lot he was drifting off towards the end because it was getting late I was like it's nearly finished now the final fight and uh yeah he enjoyed it um he was amazed with the uh well he wanted the korean guy to win because 
Korea's Taekwondo. That's where it comes from. Yeah. So, so he can actually speak in Korean now a little bit, which is awesome. <laughs> um, really? Both, not sentences, but I mean, they can, can they can count to ten in Korean and get, like uh, so. Not this week, but next week they've got their um, grading, their promotions for the next belts. Right. And so you do your practical, so your patterns and your skills and stuff, and then you have to do your theory. And uh, for example, what's Korean for uh, trin forearm block? And it's uh, sang pao mok maki. Uh, so mak maki is Korean for block. Uh, pao mok is uh, forearm. So um, so <laughs> unintentionally, I I know Korean now as well. <laughs> so because I've been yeah. reading it through. So um, the, so yeah, the forms, the forms, everything. Yeah, the forms as well are Korean. I, I'm trying to remember a lot of them. Uh, it's been a minute since I trained taekwondo, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I wish I was a little bit younger. I wish I was a bit fitter, and I would do it with them. It's never too late. It's never too late to start. I mean, but for you, it's kind of like, when will you have the time? Because uh, you're a man of many hats. Um, so, yeah. One thing that always stood out to me about the quest I always liked was uh, I liked seeing Jean-Claude dressed as kind of this street performer mime oh, um yeah. like, i thought that was pretty on the cool streets, helping the kids yeah the i love it doing these big round houses with stilts yeah. you know while he's on stilts and stuff and he does like the backflip off and it's it's got some cheesy green screen behind it um but, but one of a, the characters he's a simple he's a sympathetic character though because you know his mother died and you know he gets abandoned by i presume he's an his grandmother and you know, he, instead of working for the mob or whatever, he's trying to help all the other little orphans and that. And it's, uh, and the music score, which, if I'm correct, it's the same guy who done the the uh, dragon, the Bruce Lee story. I okay, it's the same guy. I think it's the same guy who done the music for that, and the music in it's pretty good the soundtrack. Yeah, the music is really solid. That's another thing with the Jean Claude films is he's always had, for the most part, great music hmm. that have really, you know, it really adds to the story. To me, I'll always revert back to Lionheart. I think that's the most perfect uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme film. I think that's his best film by far. Um, one of his only films, you don't see him doing the splits. Uh, <laughs> might have been the first film that he debuted the ass shot, the gratuitous ass shot. Uh, Bloodsport doesn't really count, I think, because he had like the, the mantis on. But um, the music is the best, I think, in Lionheart. I mean, it's it's good enough to like bring you to tears. It it, it waters my uh, my eyes up quite often, uh, especially towards the end, uh, especially with little Annie. We won't get into that. I already proved that. I, yeah, it was Annie. <laughs> I don't believe that. We was debating this for like a month. <laughs> oh, it's so uh, good. I actually watched, I mean, we'll finish the Fandam Loving in a minute and get to some questions. Uh, I yeah. actually watched a, a movie the other day, what he was in on Amazon, uh, Welcome to the Jungle. Not the one with The Rock. It, this movie's also called Welcome to the Jungle. Uh, it stars um, the guy, I think he was in um, the OC. Is it Adam Brody? I think he's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adam Brody. Adam Brody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the lead. It's basically. Westbrook's company, and they go on a, you know, respond to the jungle and it's like the special forces like to train them. Well, he's actually pretty funny in this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's it's kind of like a Lord of the Flies sort of thing, because there's this one guy who's like the main guy up there, and, you know, he's egotistical, and everyone, um, what do you call it, loves him. And he starts becoming like the big leader. He's and, um, yeah, it was I think we're having some slight connection issues. I feel like Sub Zero shot a frozen ball at you and froze you for a second. Oh no. 
It's a little better. You're starting to thaw out. But no. I'll tell you what, babe. I'm going to let you unsick this question. I'm going to plug me uh, router in and out. Hopefully that will sort it out for me. I can hear you better now. You're just you're uh, slightly, slightly frozen. You answer this question, I'll talk me Wi Fi in and out, and I'll see if that does the trick. Okay, we will miss you. All right. Well, it'll be two minutes. What's the question? Right. We go. On Halloween six, Jared Eviet. Thank you. Cool question. Uh, what's what are my thoughts on Halloween six? It does have some parts that I like, but it is silly how Daniel Harris was not cast as Jamie. And the cult storyline was silly. I still like Rudd and Pleasance. Uh, very cool question. Thank you, Jared. So there is a producer's cut of Curse of Michael Myers, Halloween 6, um, that I haven't seen. But for the most part, I enjoyed Halloween 6. Um, the stuff with, the there's some behind the scenes kind of, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, whatever you want to call it, with Daniel Harris, where she was on board to do the film. She really wanted to come back as Jamie Lloyd. And they gave her a really kind of lowball offer. Um, they really, you know, like borderline insulting lowball offer for, um, you know, who is at that time the kind of the face of the franchise at that point. Right. And then I think she even got to where she was like, okay, like let's, let's do it. And then they wrote her part to be minuscule. Um, Like, I don't know, like, you know, so like the Jamie character, I think is in the film for less than five minutes at the beginning. And she's giving birth and it's, it's strange. I mean, the timeline is very strange too. Uh, so um, I didn't know how to take this question off the screen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the answer. But, uh, but yeah, so there was, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but yeah, like um, dimension films, like they, you know, they were behind those, those, later iterations of Halloween, but yeah, they had, they had given, they had given Daniel Harris a low ball offer. Yeah. And she wanted to do it and then kind of agreed to do it. And then, yeah, they wrote her like this, this, this nothing part. Cause she said and, she even got, went to a lawyer to get like a waiver signed so she could be yes. in the movie. She was she underage. She got emancipated. Uh, I believe that's the term. Yeah. To, to do this film. Uh, so she could like, yeah, negotiate all our stuff. And then it was just like this nothing part. And then I want to say that they kind of backed out of it, um, which makes sense. I mean, you know, Rob Zombie definitely knew how to value her as an actress and she put her in a the remake. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, and I've said this many times, but who in their right mind, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, Rob Zombie would make better films than David Gordon Green, right? But, I will do the first Rob Zombie Halloween. Not so much a fan of the second one. Nope. Um, but I'll take that first Rob Zombie Halloween over any of these three recent uh, trilogy. You know, the, the, the less said about those, the better. But, but yeah, and I really enjoyed uh, Paul Rudd as well as Tommy, you know, as Tommy Doyle. That was yeah. kind of like first. Um, I want to say this came out. He might have done this like just before he did Clueless. Um, I think it but, came out before Clueless, but it got. I think he might have filmed it before Clueless, but he released it after Clueless. That makes sense. That sounds more familiar. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was something like that. But you know, uh, a good friend of mine, Chris, uh, runs Bulletproof Action Cinema, and. Um, 
you know, we're all big Michael Worth fans. And there's somewhere, I think there's screen test of Michael Worth auditioning for that role as well, the Tommy Doyle role uh, that we call Rudd. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's a list of other uh, kind of name guys that went out for that part. But needless to say, you know, that was, that was the first, it's probably the first time I think I, I honestly, I saw that before I saw Clueless. Um, but I thought Paul Red was, yeah, I thought it worked, you know? Um, and, and with that said, I do like Anthony Michael Hall as Tommy Doyle. I think he was poorly used. And I think that that could have and should have been. Or badly written. Badly written, yeah. I yeah. mean, how many times can you say Halloween dies tonight, right? So no evil dice tonight, man. <laughs> or evil dice, exactly. I mean, I <laughs> try to block it out of my my memory. Evil dice tonight. I mean, I would love for anyone in the chat or whatever, if you have a count of how many times that's actually said in that movie, please, because I'm sure it's. I mean, at least twenty, maybe thirty. I don't know. I lost count and interest pretty quickly. Um, but I think Paul Rudd's. I, I like Halloween six. I like curse of Michael Myers. Um, I thought it started to delve into that thorn subplot a bit much, which I thought was kind of interesting, but it just seemed like it's starting to like really spread itself out in different directions. Um, you know, you have at the end of part five, uh, the man in the boots um, getting off the bus and, blowing up the jail to get Michael out of uh, the there prison. Was so many, the there, there were so many. I, so <laughs> they ripped that guy in, the character, because they thought it'd be cool. And it was an excuse how to break Michael out. But they had no idea who it was going to be. At first, it was going to be like Michael Myers' brother, his long lost okay. brother. Uh, there was like all these other characters. They eventually settled on, uh, what was his name? The um, doctor. He was a doctor, yeah. Um which kind of made sense in a way. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, the, um, H2O I enjoyed. Uh, Resurrection, not so much. <laughs> oh, um, Resurrection. So about that, the better. I'll take Trip over the new ones. I'll take over the new ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've, because I've had to leave and come back, everyone, I've missed a lot of questions. So if you got a question what you've already asked ask it again and i'll uh, bring it up for you um godly chris going, there's a good documentary on personal michael Myers, like halloween the making of like there's a good little documentary on that, that yeah. explains it. and so you know thank god for youtube because we're now yeah. able to enjoy so many of these kind of neat uh, documentaries and extra features and things of that nature that might have gone on or go on to these blu-rays that maybe we don't have access to um so yeah my favorite my my favorite ever commentary on a movie is uh armageddon okay really ben, ben affleck doing the commentary for armageddon i haven't heard it have you seen the movie once i think i was working at the cinema uh right. basically, basically asteroids you know on its way to destroy the earth so they train these oil drillers to uh, to train them into becoming astronauts to send them up and break it apart. So Ben Affleck is doing the commentary because uh, he's one of the oil drillers. And he said he turned to, I think it was Michael Bay. It must have been Mike. It, it, it was Michael Bay. I turned to Michael Bay. He said, I've turned to Michael Bay. And I said, why was it easier to train, ast uh, train oil miners, oil drillers to become astronauts and not teach astronauts how to you know drill and things like that and he turned around and he just told me to shut the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> it makes that but he's, it was a great question but yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's one of my favorite ones that ah oh, and also mm -hmm. uh you've seen tropic thunder of course i fucking love that movie definitely something with video on here so robert downey jr's character um his name it's so it's Kirk Lazarus, but what's his character's name in you know for the movie? Kirk Lazarus, he plays Sergeant Osiris, is it? 
Lincoln yeah, Osiris. A... Lincoln Osiris. Good memory. And um, Ben Stiller's character says to him, Tuck Speedman, he says, why are you still in character? No, man, I don't drop character to after the DVD commentary. And he actually keeps it during the DVD commentary. Oh, that's great. <laughs> he stays in character. I haven't watched it, but I'm sure it's on YouTube. But, oh, man, I fucking love that movie. Um, yeah, it's amazing. What do you mean, you people? What do you oh, mean, you people? <laughs> yeah. I think Tom Cruise and Matthew McConaughey are also big standouts in that film. Like, that's this, <sighs> so good. This is, this is Flaming Dragon. Well, Flaming Dragon. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> How come he, I'll blow a shit storm of you? Now he puts down. We, don't ne- we do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> At least you got to pick your son. <laughs> <laughs> So many good moments of that film. Kill the line. What was it? Ah. I, kill, I killed the thing I love the most. A prostitute. I killed a panda. No man, Amanda's probably not even her real name. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> the Halloween films. I think any of the Halloween films that were shot in Salt Lake City, which we're looking at like four, five, and six. There's just something to them. I thought they really nailed the atmosphere, and um, I enjoy I enjoy all of them. You know, yeah, I I enjoy most all the Halloween films, with the exception of Resurrection, mm. uh, which was shot in Vancouver, and they rebuilt that entire house, that entire Myers house and everything. Um, so I think Ryan Merriman. Uh, this is one of the better parts of that film and he's not in it much. Um, but yeah, the Salt Lake city, uh, Halloween films have a special place in my heart. Cause that's when I was like really deeply yeah. involved. Like Mangoria, I was getting like every issue, every, every month. So, um, good stuff. Awesome. Uh, Godly Chris. Thank you. Godly Chris. You're actually a trooper because he streams the shows. When we're doing the watch alongs. Oh, cool. Thank you. So, yeah, so thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, Paul, this is a great question for you, Paul. Paul, was there ever a big movie you missed out on due to scheduling conflicts or something that kept you from being able to do the movie, even though you wanted to? Hmm. Uh... <laughs> I did. I did go out for the. Conan remake with yeah. Jason Momoa. I went out for a character named Artis, who, um, in the final movie, it was played by I want to say like Anzu Anani, and I can't remember his name. Um, terrific actor, um, but basically, I originally when I got the the script for that. Um, he was kind of a an Errol Flynn uh, swashbuckling kind of pirate guy. And I remember because the, the character breakdown, it was like they described him as like rakishly handsome. And it was with this flair and all this stuff. And it was like his old friend who he unites with uh, or reunites with later on. Um, and I loved it. I mean, it was probably one of my best auditions and it got so far to where they were lining up my passports and wow. everything seemed like a go. And then the complete thing just like came to a halt and we didn't hear anything. And then they issued a bunch of rewrites and they completely changed that character. Um, not, he wasn't, they changed it basically to like, I want to say like an African soldier or something it was something along those lines but i was um that that was that was a bummer um because that would have been a lot of fun but uh but then i saw the movie and i was like ah okay (laughs) (laughs) so um but i was yeah that was one that i was really excited about um but in terms of scheduling conflicts, I mean, there were a few projects, um, a lot of them music videos that I had booked uh, that I remember 
um, when I was working for WWE, they came in and um, and I had my schedule cleared and everything. And then all of a sudden they were like, actually, we added you to the house shows this week, <laughs> you know, and like, and it was like, that's not good. You know, when you're signed on for something, no matter how big or small, yeah. and all, like, you get pulled out of it. So that was very frustrating. Um, one I remember in particular was like a Los Lonely Boys music video where I was like the lead. Um, and uh, yeah, just some different things kind of in that realm. Uh, but but yeah, at the time that, that Conan one was really frustrating. Uh, and um, I don't know, like I got really good marks for the for the Superman audition I did. Um, not being six feet tall did kind of work against me, I would say. Um, but at the time, you know, Brandon Ralph wasn't a known no. actor either. Like that was something they were very adamant about was that they were, they were dead set on getting like an unknown actor for that. And I remember, uh, reading for that and getting really high marks on that. And that started to kind of seem like it was starting to move along a little bit. And that was, you know, you would do this whole audition as like Clark and then you would do this whole other audition as like Superman. Um, so that was really cool, but it was very uh, hush, hush, tight lipped kind of thing. Um, I had a, <clears throat> Oh, another one <clears throat> was uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The beginning. Right. I, I initially had read for the Matthew Bomer character. I think his name's Eric in the movie. Yeah. He's like the brother. And that got well received, but then my manager at the time um, was adamant that I read again for like this other character and somehow got me to read for this other character who was like the leader of this biker gang. And so, and that ended up going to, oh, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember his name, but he's, he's a, he's an awesome actor uh, and a bit older than I am. Um, I think he was like the older brother in, um, was it Billy Madison? No. Uh, either which way it got to where I was like, well, I, I should probably learn how to ride a motorcycle. And I, I went into like this, this hardcore uh, motorcycle class to try and get my motorcycle license, like within, you know, like a week or two. And that's when I discovered that I don't belong on a motorcycle. Uh, all the classroom stuff I passed, no problem. But man, when it came to riding a motorcycle, it just, it wasn't something that I was, uh, mm. so, um, was it Taylor, ha Taylor Handley? No, no, not Taylor Handley. He played the younger brother. Right. It so was, I've got Matt, Matt Bomer played Eric. Right. Taylor Handley played Dean. Right. Uh, Taylor Handley not. Uh, it was, um, Lee Turgeson. Turgeson. Yes. What's who What's I that? love Lee Turgeson. He's great. And he's in one of my favorite horror films that gets completely overlooked uh, called The Collection, which is a sequel to The uh, Collection. Yes, I love the movies. The Collection is awesome. Yeah. And I think The Collection is really good too, but I think The Collection is better. And Oops, they the body have, count. It's, it's awesome. And they've... <laughs> the with the whole... Yeah, they, I mean, it's it's so good. and has one of the best end credit songs. Um, and so... But that one, yeah, sure enough, went to Lee Turgeson. Whenever you have like an audition and you're you're getting really good feedback on it, and then things start to kind of progress, and then all of a sudden it goes kind of silent, and then all of a sudden you find out that they cast somebody else. It's not so much of a sting when you realize it went to a name guy, yeah, right? Um, Instead of like a nobody or someone. Yeah, and I mean, but even, on your level, sort of thing. Even in that case, though, you know, you come to realize, like, well, you know, I do the best 
presentation that I could bring, like I did everything, like made my presentation unique to me and did, you know, the best I could. Um, I'm grateful for all these auditions. Uh, but then if they happen to cast somebody that I'm kind of like, well, who is that? You know, then I, there's a reason for it. Right. And I'm not going to think like, Oh, like they did a shitty job or this, like, um, I think most of the, the parts that I've lost out to, um, to name guys or, or not, they were still, they were great actors. You know, they were solid. There was yeah. no game in that. Um, you told me you, um, lost out on Supernatural. Was it Sam Maldini was auditioning for? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was the Jared Padalecki role. Sam. Yeah. Yeah. But very early on. Yeah. I remember reading the, the the first uh script for that and you know this is like you're reading for like the pilot basically um but that was, that was a great read. it was so cool it was a great read too it was a lot of fun um what else i did i there was there was a time i went into audition for a commercial in this uh big casting office and then I saw that there was another thing reading in the usually like back when back when you used to read in person, um, you would go to like a lot of times these big kind of casting offices where uh, several casting agents would be housed up in the same kind of building or on the same floor. And so there might be different things all reading at the same time. And I noticed this read uh, or this casting and they were like, if you have a uh, pro wrestler or MMA experience, like something, something, uh, what is this? You know, and I usually don't do this, uh, but I said, Hey, like I have quite a bit of professional wrestling experience. Like, you know what? It, and they were like, Oh really? And like we just started talking and then sure enough, they handed me the, the script, like the full script uh, in a hard copy, you know, this was like a hundred something odd pages. Um, and they were like, can you come back later today? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. You know, so I raced to the library and read this script and was trying to put together this characters for like a, uh, like a hunter in this werewolf movie um, that I think was like direct to video, but it was, um, they were shooting in like Romania or something. Uh, and I'm, it's like werewolf dead of night or night of some, uh, I can't remember what it was. Um, but anyways, that part ended up going to Steven Bauer. Oh, um, yeah. Right. And so that was another one where I, I got amazing feedback in the room, which, you know, for any actor that goes into audition, like that's not, that's not as, that's not very common to get a lot of really good feedback. I mean, you start creating dialogue. That's one of the things I really miss about auditioning in person is that it really, it affords you the opportunity to, to create dialogue with the casting director and you can ask questions, you know, like, um, or you should, good questions. Um, but that, that was one of those ones that, you know, you get a lot of really good feedback and um, you start to start to think like, oh, maybe this could be good. Um, but then it went to Stephen Bauer, and I was like, well, I get it, <laughs> you know, like, he's in a lot of things, he's been gleaming the cube. Uh, so you know, and so, uh, oh, well, what was the one I watched recently, Kickboxing Academy or something? <laughs> oh, the one that I showed you or told you about, or no, no, not, I got it mixed up with like another one, and um, oh, right. Well, I forgot what name of it, and there's like a Power yeah, Ranger in it. More kid driven, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I know. What you, yeah, Kickboxing Academy. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, was Khan from the Crest not the same guy who played Tong Pro? No, it's his brother. <laughs> it's his brother. It's Abdel Kisi. So, um, Michelle Kisi plays Tong Po in Kickboxer, and he's also one of the. Um, military kind of bounty hunter guys in Lionheart who goes to get him. Um, 
and he's been in other things as well, but it's his brother, Abdel Kisi, who also plays Attila in Lionheart. So um, he is the big uh, Mongolian in the quest. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. I like James Remar a lot in the quest. I think he's a really, he plays like Dan, Dan Divine. Divine. Heavyweight champion in the world. Max Divine. Yeah, Maxi. Max Divine. Yeah. Um, and he's like, New York City. It's like, he's, he's like a snake. No, he's a monkey. Like, he's like, he's just, his mind is blown. Watching By the way, Roger, Roger, Roger Moore hated filming that movie because he hated fandom. But he Come said, on. But he, he made. Island. He's psychic character, Hobbs. No, yeah, uh, Smythe. Um, oh, um, they said man, we just be- we became best friends. <laughs> that guy, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. He's also in Halloween Four, uh, in a very small part at the beginning when um, yes, the, they uh, go. Fucking... Yeah, and he's like, "Welcome to hell." And they're like yeah, going down. To guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, they're yeah, they're yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's yeah, saying all this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's he's a he's one of those like that guy actors, and I'm embarrassed I'm blanking on his name, um, but he's always great uh, as yeah. well. So, yeah, um, shout out uh, to that actor. <laughs> hey, Paul James, thanks for the show. Uh, you guys ever watch uh, David Lynch movies, especially Blue Velvet? Dennis Hopper was awesome. Funny enough, I've seen that pop up on my Amazon the other night, but I haven't actually watched yeah, it. Great, Blue Velvet. It might be, might be my favorite David Lynch film. Funny enough, um, what else did Dennis- he do? The name rings a bell. I'm sorry. What else did David Lynch do? The, the name rings a bell. Uh, Naked Lunch. Uh, a lot of people get him confused with Cronenberg for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, David Lynch is behind Twin Peaks. Right. Um, but Dennis Hopper's amazing. Yeah. Blue Velvet. Like, I'm a huge Dennis Hopper fan. And it has Kyle McLaughlin as well. Um, That's right. And uh, it's, yeah. So, like, his, he got, he got cast in that. Dennis Hopper. Basically had carte blanche from Hollywood after he did Easy Rider. And Hollywood was like, you can make whatever you want. I'm trying to remember what studio it was. Um, but they were like, this is genius. Like, you made so much money for us for Easy Rider. I don't know if it was like United Artists. Either way. Um, so they gave him carte blanche. They're like, make whatever you want. And he went and made this movie in Peru. Uh, in the Peruvian like Andes uh, mountains um, called the last movie. And it's, I want to say the film debut of like Chris Christopherson. He basically just invited all his friends to come down and, and play this, this, in this movie that he wrote and directed and starred in called the last movie. And he's basically playing a cowboy in a village they're filming a Western in this uh, village in Peru and the Peruvian kind of um, natives witness this film being made and decide to start kind of replicating it. And they're making big movie cameras out of like bamboo sticks and all this stuff. And they, they think it's real. Hmm. And then they look at his cowboy as kind of this, um, almost like this this divine character. And I mean, it's such a bizarre movie. Um, but Sounds like they were the doing three something. Amigos. Like <laughs> uh, yeah, but like in a serious, yeah, uh, psychedelic kind of way, because uh, they were doing like so much coke filming this movie that like so much of the budget just kept going to like. This coke supply that they were just nonstop. I, right I heard that was the same thing for MK Annihilation. For which one? MK and uh, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. I I heard very similar oh, stories. I believe it. <laughs> um, and so 
he was living in Taos or like Rancho de Taos, just like a small little bit outside of Taos at the time. And this famous old uh, artist, the Dodge Lou Allen house. And so he wasn't even living in Hollywood at the time. He was just this Hollywood rebel. And he bought this theater in town, uh, this like one screen cinema where he would edit his movie, the last movie, he would edit it uh, during the week or on the, on the weekends. And he would play movies for free, like cartoons for free for the children in the town. While you know, in between him editing his magnum opus, and then he turned in his cut to the studio, and it was the movie was forty hours long, <laughs> like yeah, forty hours long, and they were like, uh, what? <laughs> and like, um, so they were like, this guy's out of his fucking mind, and there is a copy of the last movie out there. Like I've seen a version of it. I think that comes in it just under two hours or around two hours, mm. oddly enough. And it's coherent and it's very entertaining. Um, but that, that started to twist. Uh, that started his slow descent into getting kind of blacklisted for a while from Hollywood. Um, so blue velvet was kind of one of those things that he was still needing to kind of prove himself to these studios that didn't want to hire him. Um, shout out to Canon Films and Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, because that was like one of his comeback films. Um, and so, yeah, Blue Velvet's great. And you know, he in the original script, like his character has this um, nitrous, you know, to get high. Like he's just this fucking maniac. And I guess like in the original script, it was, you know, David Lynch had wrote it as helium. And he was like, like, like this look like I've, I've done both. Like nitrous isn't like not, you really, we should do nitrous instead. Cause like with helium, I'm going to have this ridiculous voice yeah. throughout. And it just, it's going to be silly. And he was like, Oh, okay. And like, so he like brought all this drug knowledge to that <laughs> role, which kind of really helped him stand out. Um, Another actor in that movie, um, God, I'm blanking. Uh, Dean Stockwell is yes. fucking awesome. Fucking He's creepy, man. so creepy in Blue Velvet. It's called that um, fucking Quantum Leap. He was in Dune. Yeah. Um, Quantum Leap, that's the guy, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, do, do, you know, know. do you know? Do you know? Do you know the making of the sequel series? Well, you know, huh? Do you know they're making a new sequel series to that? Quantum Leap? I've read for it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember. It was... I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, i trying to remember what the part was. It wasn't like anything... Like a, a lead or anything, but I, I've read for it. I haven't watched it. Um, because I think it's... It's... They've, they've made it. Like, they've... Like I think it's in a, like the first season, um, hmm. so uh, that's another one where they really kind of go against type with the main character. That was a show I really enjoyed growing up. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you mentioned it a minute ago, actually. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm a big horror movie fan. We all are one boss gaming. Uh, what's your opinion on sequels for Chainsaw Massacre and Night of the Living Dead? They were wacky comedies. Thoughts? Great question. Thank you, One Boss, One Gaming. Um, okay. <laughs> A lot of people might not agree with this. However, I love Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Toby Hooper's a genius, especially considering the the way that film was made. Uh, a film like that would never be allowed to get made today unless it was super non-union under the radar because, you know, they were working, I want to say, close to like 20-hour days. It was like absurd, right? You just, you don't, 
you don't put people through these conditions. Um, and this is like in the dead of Texas heat and um, using real uh, pig heads and innards and all this stuff that was just under these like heat lamps and rotting. And it was just like yeah. everyone miserable. Um, it's, it's an ugly film, if that makes sense. It is. But, I mean, it, you know it's, what I mean? It, yeah, it's very, it's very ugly and rough and very raw. And I think that's very much part of its appeal. <laughs> um, and over here for years, you know. Yeah, it was on the video nasties list, wasn't it? I, rem I remember me. Uh, so my mother loves horror movies as well, and uh, me, me dad not so much. But uh, he, I think he's scared of them actually. But oh, um, I know. But my mother loved horror movies, and it must have been someone in the chat will correct me, but I think it was like two thousand three, two thousand four, maybe. And uh, Channel Four over here started like showing horror movies every Sunday night, nine, ten o'clock sort of time. So me and my brother would stay up, and there was the big thing like Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the first time in thirty odd years, whenever it was since released, would be shown on terrestrial TV. And my mother was like, you know, this is one of the scariest movies ever, and um, no one can get to see this film. So I watched it and. It's weird because, like, one of the most gruesome deaths is when he puts her on the meat hook. You don't yeah. actually see the meat hook go into her, but it's in your head. And obviously, there's right. the hammer, the guy said, and Paul Franklin. <laughs> I didn't oh, like yeah. Franklin. <laughs> and he was like, apparently, like, people were like, apparently, the cast was just, I mean, the cast was getting very annoyed. They hadn't been paid. A lot of them didn't get paid even when the film got sold. Um, was it Bryerson or Bri uh, I'm trying to remember the distributor, but a lot of them really didn't even get paid until well after that movie was done. Like, you know, there was, mm. and, and um, I'm trying to remember the actor who played Franklin, but he, he was like, I'm, you can find somebody else. Like until you guys pay me, like I'm not, find somebody else then because i'm done like i'm not and they like wrote him this check i think it was like a hot check or something and it's like a, it's like you can barely see it in his shirt uh when he gets when he falls down the hill and goes rolling yeah. down the hill there's like a little thing in his shirt pocket because it like it literally they were like okay fine like we need to shoot this thing i'm like, I'm like um was he, really, uh, was he really handicapped or was he just acting no yeah i think he was just acting because right. he was up uh, partain, partain, something partain. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, he shows up at the end of part. Oh, I'm blanking. There's a hospital scene at the end of one of these. It might be. Oh, um... I think it might have been a deleted seen as well but him and marilyn burns show up at the end in like different roles right um but needless to say i love texas chainsaw massacre obviously i'm from texas so like it's near and dear to my heart um the house was moved from its original location um an old friend of mine actually his family were all buried in the Baghdad Cemetery, which is where that opening shot in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where they're explaining the grave robberies and everything, that was shot in Leander, Texas, uh, at the Baghdad Cemetery. Um, and I have, you know, a buddy of mine that had a lot of family buried there and stuff. So, like, if you kind of do your homework and size it up, you can find that marker, uh, basically where they shot that. But um, the house is since been moved it's now like bed and breakfast where mm -hmm. the original location of that house is i think now stands like a, a giant marriott as part of like a big shopping center just on the edge of round rock um because i used to live up there uh but it's it's you know it's kind of a slow burn i love texas gene some massacre um yeah. but i absolutely love 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 the 2003 really? reimagined. Yeah, I think to me that is one of the the best, 
if you say modern day, I mean, whatever, but it, it's seriously one of the best, uh, if not at yeah. the top of the list of that franchise, easily. Mm. Marcus Nussel's best film, in my opinion. The cast is amazing. Um, they got Daniel Pearl, the original cinematographer, who was with, you know, um, and, you know, this is a bunch of, like, University of Texas guys who made that original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Ted, Ted Nicolau, who went on to do a lot of films for, like, Full Moon, um, was a part of that crew as well. Um, so these are all, like, University of Texas film students and film guys who, who made this thing. Um, so they got Daniel Pearl, the cinematographer, um, for that Texas Chainsaw in 2003. He actually was also the cinematographer for Marcus and the Spell. For the 2008-9 Friday the 13th. Um, yeah. I like that up. one. Yeah, it's great. So you see a lot yeah. of very uh, very similar um, shots with the light coming through the trees and everything. Because they shot that in Austin as well. Um, but the, yeah, there's something about that 2003 Texas Chainsaw Massacre that I just absolutely love. I think it's incredible. Yeah. And, it, you know, funny enough, I remember when that, when rumors were kind of swirling around Austin that they were going to make that film <laughs> and we'd have to ask him but at the time you know i was doing texas independent wrestling um someone i was having uh quite a lot of matches with at the time was lance hoyt who oh, yeah. yeah people i guess would know is is it lance archer is that what he's known yeah as? yeah okay so he and I were talking, and I don't know if it actually happened, but I believe he was he had a he had an audition lined up for Leatherface. I could see it because he, you know, That's he's nice. like, yeah, yeah. And so he and I were talking, and I remember he him saying that like I think he had lined up, or I don't know if it if it happened or what, but he there was he was kind of in line to do an audition for Leatherface. And this is like long before they obviously they cast Andrew Bernarski, who I thought was great. I thought he was amazing, right? He was amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to reach out to him, um, see what, if I can work my magic. I actually watched Batman Returns the other night. Oh man, yeah, Chip. So, first time his son's watched it. I'm actually so me, me eldest now. He's nine, so I'm introducing him to a lot of the films I watched as a kid. And he's like, yeah, that this is pretty damn good. <laughs> What's his name? Is it Chip or is it no? It's Chip. It's Chip. Chip. Yeah, Chip Shrek. Chip Shrek. Yeah, uh, he's good. he's great. Um, and he's also Zangief in the Zangief. Street Fighter Street Fighter movie with Jean Claude. <laughs> it all circles oh, back. I'm sure he's got some great stories. I'll reach out to him. Uh, so we will. Corner. We will eventually do a. Um, We'll list the order of what we felt the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films are. I love part two. Part three, nah, that was the first one owned by New Line Cinema once they got the property. That's why it's not called Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's just called Leatherface. Yeah. That was also the first one that they shot outside of Texas. It was shot like in New Hall, just north of Los Angeles. And there's yeah. a, apparently a slight scene um, in the woods where you can hear people screaming from the roller coasters at Six Flags nearby yeah i mean say what you will i do there are parts of leatherface that i do enjoy i thought it had a really great um teaser before the film was shot where you actually see kane hodder dressed as leatherface um so funny enough kane hodder uh everyone you know friday the 13th as jason and also as hatchet and so many other things i mean kane hodder is a one of the icons in horror cinema, but he he's Leatherface in this um, Lady of the Lake kind of setup um, where they're kind of zeroing in on this lake and this big gruff individual. He's just got his back turned, and then all of a sudden he turns around and like the the chainsaw comes out of the lake, and like he grabs it and he turns around and it's like Leatherface, you know, Texas, you know, Chainsaw Massacre three or whatever. But that's Kane Hodder as Leatherface right. in that. So um, I I enjoyed uh, Next Generation with Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. Uh, that was done by Kim Henkel, who was one of the original uh, producers. Um, 
and the stories behind that are really interesting because they're you know matthew mcconaughey had uh had done days and confused and he had like his truck packed up to go out to hollywood and then he went in to read for the like, his buddy kim henkel in this little part where he was supposed to be like this this kind of uh hero who rides in on a motorcycle and takes renee zellweger off at the end and that part got completely excised and they thought hey like would you want to stick around and read for this Vilmer character, this villain? And they handed him a spoon. And they were like, uh, scare, uh, I can't remember the secretary's name, but they were like, can you scare her for a bit? And he just went into like this whole improvised maniac scene with like a spoon or something like, like terrorizing her. And it, you know, and it, they just gave him the spot or gave him the job on the spot. So he had to unpack his truck and stayed in Austin for a little bit longer and made a Texas Chainsaw for the next generation so um yeah the 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 most recent one for netflix not a thing yeah, love it next, yeah next question <laughs> uh by the way thanks everyone for joining those 57 of you so if you can hit the like button and if you haven't subscribed please do if you enjoy this it really does help us out uh sarah connor hi paul is anywhere in the uk to watch your new movie uh, I believe there is. There's. Well, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> there are apps or streams or something. I don't know if it's. Uh, there are. There are ways to watch it. I'm. I've had friends of mine over there who told me they were able to find it on something app. I'd have to look back and see what it was, but um. My best friend, the Baby Snatcher. It's it's a it's a movie of a very particular genre. Uh, we're not trying to we're not trying to win a bunch of awards here. We're just trying to entertain. So uh, if you look it up, um, hopefully you'll be able to find it on one of the one of the apps, streaming apps. I'm not really sure how all that works. Um, I think it might be on YouTube. It was, and then I right. think it got down. Um, so. Yeah, uh, but I, a, f a couple of friends of mine in the UK have, have watched it um, on some of these other kind of apps I'm not familiar with, so it is possible. Um, we'll, have, uh, we'll have 10 more minutes, Paul, because I know you have to get off. Yeah, no sweat. We'll rifle through these. I'm kind of long-winded. I apologize. I just <laughs> I love talking this stuff. Ricky Bobby, looking good, boys. Uh, show you. time. Favorite Tarantino movies. Here we go. Go ahead. Hmm. I'm not saying it's my favorite, but you know one I really do enjoy. There's two. I I love all these movies. I haven't seen Jackie Brown yet, but I fear that's actually the worst. Oh man, Jackie Brown's badass. Go ahead. Yeah. I have to yeah. check it out. Really good. I I love Once Upon a Time in America. <laughs> I do. Uh, Once Upon yeah. a Time in Hollywood. Sorry. Once Upon yeah. a Time in Hollywood. Uh, and uh, I love Hateful Eight. I think Hateful okay. Eight is really good. Um, love Django. Django's amazing. Really? Uh, it's not, best, it wish, be best wish is Jamie Foxx. Hope you get well soon. Yeah. Um, Have you seen the original Django? I've heard of it when I, as a kid. I saw advertisements when I was a kid. I do remember it because I remember the song Django. Well, I've never Amazing. actually watched it. One of my favorite films of all time. So, Django Unchained is not one of my Tarantino picks, yeah. specifically because I love the original oh, Django so much. So, it has some great cameos, but Le that Leonardo would be. DiCaprio, yeah. man, Calvin Candy. What a villain. Yeah. Samuel yeah. Jackson's character. Oh, yeah. He's just evil. Um, I love all these movies. I love Kill Bill. Um, I one and two. Dogs. I think Reservoir Dogs is. Like, fucking almost perfect. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, fucking uh, Pulp Fiction. Like, I love every one of these movies. Uh, Glorious Bastards. Yeah. Um, apparently, like he said, for, I, I haven't seen... Oh, what was the other one he'd done? It was like Gra Grindhouse or something like that, yeah. but I haven't watched that, but I heard that was... I heard it wasn't as good, so I haven't watched that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very genre -y. Uh Him and Robert Rodriguez, you know, they had done Dust Till Dawn together. Um, I love how he wrote that scene. He's directed that earlier part where 
They go to the Titty Twister and he's got Selma Hayek dancing for him because he's got a foot fetish. And I'm like, you bastard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's great in that. Um, yeah. I mean, Reservoir Dogs, I think that's it's such a badass film. Uh, I also love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I didn't like it at first, but it really grew on me. Um, yeah. But he also, he wrote the screenplay. He didn't direct it, but he wrote the screenplay for True Romance. As well, uh, uh, yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, yeah, originally titled uh, Motor City, I believe. Um, and then, yeah, Tony Scott went on and did a uh, amazing job. Um, yeah, Tarantino is he's he's awesome. I'm I'm a big fan, absolutely big fan. Really enjoyed Inglorious Bastards as well. So yeah. Um. Josh Jones, thank you. Hey guys, oh yeah, thoughts on Samoa Joe in Twisted Metal? Good for him. I think that's cool. Fuck yeah! I mean, that's a huge. Uh, that's looks, gonna be a huge fun. Yeah, I didn't. I never. I you know, I'm not familiar with the game. Other than that, I know that it's a game. Um, I I like Will Arnett. I like yes. Anthony Mackie. I think Anthony Mackie's a terrific actor as well. Um, you know. Uh, for those of us who know what Samojo looks like, you can be like, "Yeah, that's those are his shoulders, that's his arms. Oh, yeah, that's those are his nipples." Um, okay, but you know, <laughs> so but like, good for him. I mean, that's a that's a hell of a that's a hell of a uh, a part to land, you know. So hopefully, it brings him more work. Um, it's not. I guess they're not using his voice. Or his face, or I'm not. I don't know. I've just yeah, seen. Didn't, didn't didn't sound like him in the trailer and no, like what in the uh, ads. But, I'd be um, wrong actually doing the voice. Right, um, I'll have to double check not, that. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. I'm not the biggest fan of video game movies, um, unless we're talking about House of the Dead, which has a very special place in my heart for how how comically. Entertaining. That is. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, Super Mario Brothers movie was great. Okay, I will say that the new one, not the uh, yeah. Bob Askins. Uh, Piss off, Lugazamo, man! You're gonna get Lugazamo hot. Also, Dennis Hopper. Yeah. Right. Uh, that was oh. a weird movie. Mortal Kombat still my favorite. Um, by the way, have you heard about this new fit movie? Uh, Mel Gibson's bringing out. About exposing like Hollywood. I heard. I heard. I'll say it now. Mel Gibson didn't kill himself. Yeah. <laughs> Someone uh, made a prediction. They said over the next few weeks, you'll start seeing all these reports like Mel Gibson done this, Mel Gibson done that. They said you will start seeing that in the news next few weeks. And I can see it happening. Yeah. Um, man. I like his stuff, man. You know, I grew up on Mel Gibson films, so. Uh, thoughts on Sorex coming out? Sorex? Didn't read the number nine. I didn't see Spiral. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, I heard it was, it was pretty. But I would it still. Was it was obviously the killer was. <laughs> okay, that's what I heard. Um, I felt like it started to get quite repetitive. After a while, um, I kind of lost interest when they killed off uh, Donnie Wahlberg's character. Um, yeah. And there's another detective that I really liked, too. Oh, um, Str um, Strom. Strom, yeah. And so when they killed, I was just kind of like, nah. Um, Great death, though. Yeah. And then I think, I want to say Chatty Danella appears as like, Another side detective in one of the later ones. Uh, he was the, in the he was, final he was chapter. The, maybe. He was the friend in Final Destination who gets the bathtub death scene where the thing wraps around his neck. Yeah, he played, I know you mean that. He played Todd in Final Destination. But yeah, Chatty Danella appeared, I think, in one of those later iterations of Saw and they kill him. They kill off all the, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, I would watch them. There's some of them that I'm just kind of like, eh. 
Um, I take it you wouldn't have to be up to date on your Saw knowledge to enjoy Saw 10, but um, That's, who knows? Um, Probably check yeah, it out I mean, if it's white or something. You know? I don't know what it'll be. Um, I don't know if it can't be a sequel because, well, Tobin Bell's in it. Is so, he? Yeah, so it can't be a sequel because <laughs> he's dead. <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah. Um, Paul, have you seen the new Scream? I actually enjoyed it. I actually watched that the other night. Did you like it? That's all right. Um, New York it, City, right? Yeah, it wasn't scary, but I'll tell you what it was. It was brutal. Okay. Like, the, the, I won't spoil who the killer is. I, I predicted who the killer was, so I was actually proud of myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> sat there by myself watching it. Um, but like, I have I not thought... to answer the question. I have not seen it. I haven't seen any of the screen films after part three. Um, yeah. so sorry if that disappoints anybody, but, um, yeah. No, it was, it was all right. Um, you know, some good moments, some people's definitely got plot armor, uh, the plot armor to a point where it's just like, it, I mean, there was the one guy who got stabbed in the stomach. I'm not lying. I about seven, that I did hear. Seven or eight times. Like multiple times and still lives. It's like, okay. But it's like the second movie in a row. It's happened to the same guy. <laughs> what? Yeah, like I've, I I think he got to. I might be wrong, chat. Let me know. But I'm pretty sure in like Scream 5, because this is a direct sequel to Scream 5. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he was took away in the ambulance at the end of Scream 5. And it happens again at the end of this one. I He's might just be like, wrong. Geez, if he comes back for part seven, right? He should just look like. Well, there's the one girl. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's uh, Randy's niece. She She's at the mercy of the killer. And then you realize, you know, like, oh, she's definitely at the mercy of the killer now. But you don't see her after this point. And then she turns up at the end of the movie. I'm fine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's... Um... It's not on the top of my list. It's been a lot. I'll just say that. It's, you know, the it's original three, three, near and yeah. dear. I enjoy them. Say what you will about part three. I really enjoyed it. Um, but after that, it was just, you know, and then like with all the stuff where they don't want to pay, um, Nev Campbell, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's like, how, how can you not pay your franchise lead? Like what? Like, how can you not, like, I, I, she doesn't strike me as a greedy person, you know, but it's like, she ain't it's going on. You know. your friend character you know and so that's kind of like meh so you know well i mean fucking gal weathers isn't it courtney cox i'm not gonna spoil anything but you know she's on one, in one of that predicaments and i'm like yeah you should be dead <laughs> she's not <laughs> you said for a ton of these characters man you know a ton of these characters so that's my thing it's, it's like, it's like modern day wrestling. I was kind of like, you just got blasted in the face full force, and now you're reversing a shoot off and doing all this. Like, it's like, it, it gets to be too stupid sometimes to me. Um, well, I just, Brent, I don't know. He said the guy from Final Destination 1 was in the, played Stan. The M &M, in the Eminem yeah, uh, yeah. video. Yeah. Devin Stawa, he played Stan. Yeah, shout out to Brandon Lee, our homeboy. Um, oh, he was fun. filming with... Um, yeah. He was filming with Thingy the other day. Um, shit, yeah, he's... he might be watching this from set, so... The guy from shout Suits. I forgot his name. But, um, yeah. Uh, but... Um, we hope he's killing it out there and doing a kick-ass job out in the sticks. I think he said he said he was shooting out very remotely. Um, so hopefully he got his McDonald's coffee because uh, there's no Starbucks anywhere in sight. He was saying, uh, "Brandon's awesome, man." So any I any Irish movies you enjoyed? Fatal Deviation. 
Oh, was that the Van Damme wannabe? Yes. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my God. The song, yeah. I want to live, laugh, love, and survive. Oh, so good. Um, the Leprechaun movies don't count, right? Is that? No. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my Left Foot, is that considered? Um, I don't know. It's kind of like that one as well. What's the uh, Tom Cruise one with Nicole Kidman? Uh, Legends of the Fall? No. Um, oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> What's it called? We will up on game. Send us some recommendations yeah. of our cinema. Send us some recommendations, please. Uh, not... It's, not ice, it's not Ice Ride Shut. <laughs> it's before no. that. <laughs> Wow. I watched it as a fucking weird movie. It's a weird movie because I know it's true. <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably happening right now. And so, oh, yeah. in some form of it, uh, are you sure Leprechaun doesn't count? Because I can just go off on those, man. Those are some solid films as well. <laughs> I guess they kind of count. I suppose it's Irish folklore. Um, That's true. Yeah, man, for- Fatal Deviation, uh, Fatal Deviation, check it out. <laughs> badass. The movie's badass. Right, Paul, do you, do you want to call it a night? Do we got any more questions here? Well, uh, let's see. My left foot is Irish. It is, right? Yes. Okay, I, I knew Mine, it. Finds English. <laughs> <Ba-dum-dum>. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> let's see. Uh, Knucklehead was awful. Big show, Matt. What do you think? Uh, next question. Uh, someone mentions Mandy with Nicolas Cage. Have you seen Mandy? The movie's yeah. fucking bonkers, man. It's awesome. Yeah. And there's definitely some major Nicolas Cageisms in that film. Um, I want to see Renfield. I haven't seen it yet. I've heard good things about it, but believe yeah. me, what, what, check out Mandy. It's like an acid trip. It's insane, and it has a great soundtrack. Um, it has uh, uh, what's his name from Predator? Uh, up in the tree. Um, Bill Duke. Bill Duke. Yeah. Uh, but this movie's—it's insane, dude. It's insanity. It's insanity. It's a—it's a fucking awesome, awesome, fun movie. Uh, there's really not anything fun about it, but it's extremely entertaining, uh, gory, and it's like nothing you've probably ever seen. Um, so I highly recommend it. Sadly, the director, or no, the the composer, um, yeah, the composer to this, who, what else did he do? But he he sadly passed away. Like this was his last score. Um, and it's it's a great score uh, and a great soundtrack, but I can't say enough wonderful things about Mandy. Um, it was actually, I think, Elijah Wood that brought that script to page of attention, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, shout out to Elijah Wood. Speaking of, speaking of Elijah Wood, that film popped in to me at um, Sin City. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, funny. I, re- I auditioned for the original Sin City, the, the first one, yeah. uh, for one of the guys in the car who gets like a sword through his head. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of those maniac dudes. I had, I had read for that part. Um, I really, I dug the first one. I felt like they might have taken a long time to get the second yeah, one. Yeah, too long. And, didn't have quite as much steam behind it, but I still enjoyed it. Um, I'm a big, you know, I, I'm a big Josh Hartnett fan, so I like his little his little bit in that too. I would have liked to see him obviously a lot more of that. But uh, my favorite part of Sin City, without question, is Nick Stahl. I think uh, Nick Stahl yeah, gets zero recognition for what an amazing 
insane job he did on that film where you're sitting here thinking like that's nick stall like credit to the the makeup and effects department because they you know yeah he played yellow bastard yeah and you wouldn't know it unless you saw the credits or like you knew you're a big nick stall fan i am you know i thought he and even with so much of the the prosthetics and all that stuff on he looks disgusting he's vile um his intensity and his acting through that makeup and everything is some of his best work, in my opinion. I, I I'm a huge Nick Stahl fan. I think that's a role that he gets overlooked in quite a lot. Yeah. Real stand. I love I love um, Clive Owen in it as well. Yeah, yeah. And he's someone that's kind of just disappeared. Like there was a time he was in a lot of movies, and like a lot of people was thinking he's gonna be like the next Bond. For I wanted him as the next Bond, but He's just one of them guys. Seems to have just disappeared. Really, same as Nick Stahl. Would the same be said for like Gerard Butler? I mean, Nick Stahl's making a comeback. Actually, he's. Yeah. Uh, oh, what is it? Some sort of like spacey superhero film coming out pretty soon. Um, yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but Nick Stahl's, he took some time off, I think, to kind yeah. of focus on some other things. He's definitely it's making a big It's a great movie. A lot of people in the chat are saying there's no way they can support us and support the channel. Um, yeah, I mean, you can like and subscribe uh, financially. Uh, obviously, we're not monetized yet, but I uh, know Paul... We're numbers we're trying to up our numbers so we're going to keep doing yeah. some of these live gimmicks for a while we're going to spit out some more episodes here shortly um, it, like a paypal up or something or i don't know uh <laughs> yeah i'll just put my the, on here put your paypal on it if, if you yeah. want to donate the poll please do so yeah. <laughs> um i'll throw his, uh, the paypal up um but now we, we thank, ev we thank yeah. everyone for supporting us um i know you've been waiting a lot for us to get these episodes out and uh like i said it's just getting the schedule in but every time we get an episode out it's really well received so we thank everyone for uh checking Absolutely. in with us yeah no thank you all for your comments for taking the time to hang out with us and give your thoughts on different films and all that good stuff so you know um we'll do this again soon enough mm. uh just nice Looking through the comments real quick uh, to see uh, if there's anything we missed. Someone um, asked their favorite Sean Connery movie. Uh, ex excluding James Bond's films, because okay. I love James Bond, so I'm going to exclude James Bond. I was about and to also, there. James Bond should be British, and he should be a man. I don't care about 2023 casting, as long as he's British and he's a man. That's all I care about. If you want to create a female spy hero, by all means, but please leave James Bond as a man because he is and he's British. Yeah. And you got and cast you know, and cast yeah. Henry Cavill. Okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. know who I'm talking to. <laughs> yeah, I want your female spies, you get Kim Possible. Um uh, my favorite Sean Connery role. I I mean I'd have to go with uh, Last Crusade. Good. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. No, I'd probably have to go with Last Crusade. I was, yeah, that was one I saw at the cinema. I absolutely loved Last Crusade. I think it has a very underrated soundtrack score. It's a great, it's, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. I absolutely love that film. So, um, I watched the, uh, the Rock recently. It's the first time I watched it. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Awesome. Yeah, very strong. Yeah. Uh, Highlander. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one as well. Uh, in the original Highlander, don't they... Isn't there a shot of, like, the Freebirds or something in that, I think? Are they watching... Yeah, Rock? it's... I'm talking about it. Free... Yeah. Well, Hulk Hogan. So, Hulk Hogan said he... Um, they the studio approached him to play Highlander. Oh, my but, God. Uh, but I think he got it mixed up. I think the row they actually gave him was, like, the Freebird row, like, actually being in the wrestling ring. Oh, that's funny. 
But I think he thought they actually wanted him to be Conor McLeod. <laughs> <laughs> there can only be one <laughs> brother. <laughs> oh, man. There can only I, be I, one brother. I haven't watched The Quick in it. It's, yeah, it's called The Quick in the second one. I haven't watched that for years, but I remember enjoying it as a kid. But apparently it's one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, yeah, I haven't seen, I honestly don't remember any of them. Um, I think Edge has like a cameo in the fourth one. Oh, uh, is it the fourth one? Yeah. I've, which ones have I seen? I've seen the first one. Second one's a kid. I don't remember the third one, which is the, uh, I think it was called the Sorcerer. Or the Sorcerer. Okay. Um, I watched the fourth one. That, that has Edge in it at the beginning. Because that yeah. was the tie-in for the, the series because it's um not Connor McLeod's Duncan. I don't know if he's called Duncan yeah. McLeod. Uh and I've watched the fifth one, which is the last one as far as I remember. Um and I know they've tried to do a remake for years, but I'm like, yeah, just please don't leave my 80s movies alone. Who's your favorite Raiden? Him or James? Oh Lambert. Lambert. <laughs> the fate the fate of millions relies on you. <laughs> Sorry. Really? You're such a big Annihilation fan. Come on. Oh, no. Remar is just terrible. <laughs> Come on, dude. You may, you've heard of um, James Remar being the original Hicks, right, in Aliens? Yeah, you told me that story, yeah. He was originally Hicks. Like, if you go online and you type up James Remar Aliens, you'll see... I mean, they shot a bit of footage with him and Michael Bean they gave the the armor and all the um basically the the yeah the armor that the marines wore in aliens they gave it to each actor to decorate themselves in character and Michael Bean hated that his had that heart on the thing because James Remar is actually the one that designed that that put that did that right. so he's you know when they fired James Remar uh there's various takes on why he was let go, but it was like he was there one day and then the next day he was gone and they were like looking on the cast list and they were like, Michael Bean? Who's, what? What happened to... Uh? Um, apparently he was like not not as clear-headed as he would have liked to have been and like uh, the guy who played A Pwn, I can't remember his name. He was like a real sergeant. Real life. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he charged them in their gun train, right? And he was like, "Never put your finger on the on the trigger. Like, always keep your finger off the trigger. Like, even though these are like prop guns or blanks, not like never put your finger on the trigger." And James Jr. I guess was like out partying like every night or something. It's like blown out of his head and was fucking around or something and. Um, cause I think they shot this at, uh, was it Pinewood? I think. Yeah. Um, Pinewood Studios, I think. Yeah. And pulled the trigger and blew a hole through the wall and it blew, and it destroyed part of the little shop of horrors set that was being shot. <laughs> like, like, uh, set over next door or something. And that was like the final straw and they fired him. Uh, but yeah, if you look up James Remar aliens, you'll see footage of him like not footage but still photos of him as hicks on aliens so um pretty crazy i guess walter hill uh stuck his neck out to get him that to get him that gig and then like they had a big falling out after that um, so pretty crazy shout out oh. to the game green <laughs> right everyone thanks again for joining us um, yeah, yep, well, well, we can just keep going on and on and on, but you know, we all have things to do, and we're grateful for all y'all's time. And thank you to James for staying up late with us. And um, we'll, we're going to do this again soon. Uh, hopefully, we'll give y'all more than an hour, half hour heads up mm. next time. It's always last minute for us. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, but we're very grateful for all of you for, for tuning in, for your comments. And uh, even the comments that we didn't get to, we're reading all of them. So uh, hopefully we can get to stuff, more more questions next time. And uh, just keep growing the channel with this. Because at the end of the day, we are all marks for cinema. Or we're all cinemarks, right? 
Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll catch you in the next one. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> what are you saying?